Welcome to the final episode in a Legendarium series about the Black Death. This episode, Europe After the Plague, will focus on the plague's final outbreaks in Spain and Scandinavia. We will talk about the cures that were pursued by doctors and patients, and the society left behind by the Black Death. It was a profoundly changed world, both in terms of social organization and religion. While the Black Death would briefly resurface as pest to Secunda in 1361, the Black Death would never hit Europe with the same force that it did in the 1340s. By 1350, the Black Death had spread to the Iberian Peninsula. It first came to the Atlantic island of Mallorca, itself a trade hub for the western Mediterranean. Wherever Mallorca ships went, they left a trail of contamination. One of the first cities to suffer infection was Granada, then one of the last Islamic strongholds in Iberia. The ruling government held that Islamic law taught that God alone decided who lived and who died, so plague sufferers were told to simply wait for God to render a judgment and not seek any medical attention. Judgment came from a hyperlethal septicemic form of the plague. It was so virulent that one story told of an innkeeper, his wife, and four daughters going to bed, and none of them were alive by morning. From Granada, the pestilence swept along the golden Spanish coast towards Gibraltar. King Alfonso of Castile was then laying siege to the city. He was urged to flee, but King Alfonso insisted on staying with his army. On March 26, 1350, Good Friday for that year, King Alfonso became the only reigning king in Europe to die of the Black Death. In the same year, Spain's other Christian royal house, Aragon, suffered several deaths. King Pedro of Aragon lost a daughter and niece to the plague that spring, and his wife in October. The dress of doctors who tried to cure the sick in Spain began to take some bizarre new forms that reflected the feverish superstitions about the plague. Because physicians believed that corrupted air spread the disease, they went into almshouses wearing cloth masks with long beak-like protrusions. They stuffed these beaks with herbs and smelling salts in the belief that this would keep them from breathing the corrupted air since physicians also believed that looking at a plague victim could help spread the disease, they created special goggles made from red crystals that kept them from getting a clear look at their patients. One wonders if this helped them with diagnoses. Of course, these outlandish costumes did not prevent medieval doctors from dying in appalling numbers. As the Black Death ravaged Northern Europe, physicians and patients alike continued the desperate search for a cure. Bloodletting had been popular throughout the Middle Ages and continued to be used during the Black Death. While the wealthy could afford leeches to suck them dry, the poor had to have a blade pushed into a vein and their blood drained into a bowl. Since physicians rarely cleaned their knives, this often meant patients suffered further infections from blade wounds. Still worse, doctors threw the blood taken from patients into the street, creating yet more risk for spreading the plague. Europe's wealthiest patients could afford to make a fine powder made from crushed emeralds, mixed into a potion, baked into bread, or sometimes just eaten raw. It was described as tasting a bit like shattered glass. The most desperate began living in or near sewers in the belief that the foul fetid air would somehow drive away the miasma which brought the plague. None of these so-called cures worked, and many of them actually helped create more problems than they solved. According to legend, the Black Death came to Scandinavia in spring 1350 on an English ship that crossed the frothy North Sea, then called the German Ocean. The English vessel beached near the Norwegian city of Bergen. When locals investigated the ship, they found all hands dead of the plague. From there, the Black Death swept across the Norwegian coast. At first, it struck with its usual virulence. When a group of scouts came to the remote mountain village of Tusendal, they found only a single girl still alive out of a village of 200. From Norway, the Black Death spread to the Old Norse colonies of Iceland and Greenland. In those island colonies, so many people died that feral cattle roamed the countryside for generations, as there were no laborers to chase them down. <laughs> 
King Magnus II of Sweden believed that the Black Death was punishment from an angry god, so he ordered his Swedish subjects to eat only bread and water on Fridays and go without shoes on Sundays, walking to church barefoot in acts of penance intended to win God's pity. They did not work. The plague still ravaged Sweden. When the Black Death struck the royal house in Uppsala, King Magnus lost two brothers, Newt and Hakon. However, the plague faced new challenges in its murderous mission. The thin population and rugged terrain of Europe near the Arctic Circle meant much less food for the Black Death. Nonetheless, the bubonic plague followed the centuries-old trade routes first created by the Vikings all the way to Moscow. The Russian capital was devastated in 1352, but with this final outbreak, the Black Death finally burned itself out. Little by little, Europeans realized that the horror they called the Great Mortality had ended. Men only called it the Black Death centuries later. In the immediate term, an overwhelming sense of relief spread through Europe. In many areas, the intoxication of being alive, when up to two-thirds of the people had died, gave way to wild hedonism. In the Italian city of Orvieto, couples fornicated on the fresh grass growing on the old plague pits that housed thousands of dead. In France, so many mills, farms, and shops were simply abandoned that strangers moved in, took over, and began operating the enterprises as their own. England offers one of the clearest studies of just how much the plague changed life. Many estates were so empty of tenant laborers that peasants were in a position to call the shots. They demanded payment in cash for their labor, and if they weren't happy with the wages offered by their current landlord, they simply went looking for someone willing to cough up. Earls, dukes, and knights accustomed to being shown deference suddenly learned what it meant to be talked back to. Craftsmen could demand such high wages that they took to wearing silk clothes and belts with silver buckles. Peasants wore tight-fitting hose and even fur-trimmed garments. Nobles, on the other hand, found themselves dressing in rags, clinging only to fur mantles that they wore even in the severe heat of summer, just to prove that they were not a peasant. Whether or not anyone knew, this was the beginning of the end for the feudal system. Tragically, it was also the end of the beginning for the Black Death. Less than a decade after the outbreak which swept away two-thirds of Europe's population, the Black Death returned. If not for coming in the shadow of the Black Death, this Pestis Secunda would be an epic tragedy in its own right. In Europe, population losses could be as high as 20 to 25%. However, what struck contemporaries about the 1361 plague wasn't the number of people it killed, but who died. The young fell in disproportionate numbers. Likely, many children were born in the years following the Black Death, but they often lacked the immunities earned by their parents. Children died in horrifying numbers during the 1361 plague. Sometimes three-fourths of all the boys in a given village died within a matter of weeks. People who had already endured so much suffering and death now had to bury their own children. Yet after the Pestis Secunda, the Black Death changed. While outbreaks occurred regularly for several more centuries, it would never rage across Europe as it did in the 1340s and 1360s. It would erupt in a locality, cause the deaths of 13 or 14 percent of the population, and then vanish. And without cheap peasant labor available at the snap of a finger, men had to create labor-saving devices. In the century after the Black Death, such devices spread across Europe. Water pumps allowed mines to be dug deeper. New salting and storage techniques allowed fishermen to bring home larger catches. With peasant levies no longer available, kings turned to professional mercenaries to do their dirty work. And a century after the plague came to Moscow, Johann Gutenberg introduced Europe to the printing press so that everyone could learn about these new inventions the year that they were created. Not only did the plague change labor relations, behavior, and science, but it changed religion. After seeing so much death with no good explanation, people longed for a personal relationship with God. Chantries, or private chapels, began appearing in the homes of anyone who could afford them. 
Mysticism came into fashion as people sought personal communion with God. The wealthy, at least those who survived the Black Death, began purchasing cemeteries so the dead thrown into plague pits could be dug up and given Christian burial. More and more merchants' wills left donations to monasteries. However, this religious fervor did not translate into loyalty to the church. After all, the church had not been able to do any more about the Black Death than any other medieval institution. While 42 to 45 percent of its clergy died during the plague, often ministering to the dead and dying, what happened after the plague proved to be damaging. As the church rushed to refill its ranks with men who had too few qualifications and often demanded too much money, shameful persons began to enter the ranks of the church. Most infamous of all was the one-day priest of northern England, said to be an outlaw who preyed upon travelers six days out of the week, then lectured from the pulpit on Sunday, probably to men and women that he robbed on the road. While a straight line cannot be drawn from the Black Death to the Reformation, it's not hard to see how Martin Luther found a receptive audience with his message about religious reform over 200 years later. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.